So, soil armor. Yeah, just that residue. Keep it covered. It eliminates erosion, moderates soil temperatures, which is a big deal when it comes to biology, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. We enhance the water cycle, and of course, where, does, where do weeds germinate? On bare soil, right? They, they don't germinate as well, unless they're of the noxious variety, uh, on covered soil. So, so that soil protection or armor really does a good job at helping us with some of those pest species. Why no disturbance? Well, let's look at all the negative impacts that disturbance can give us. First of all, compaction occurs at the depth of that tillage implement. Uh, the most noticeable uh, plow pan, if you will, will be at the depth of the deepest tillage that that field or that acre has ever seen. Um, it's not always easily found, but those with a trained eye can, can take a shovel and, and find that spot. And that's where you're going to have some, some issues with roots trying to punch through there. Soil aggregate fracturing, the mixing and turning and churning, um, the release of carbon dioxide with every tillage pass, even shallow, uh, really causes some costs. High risk of crusting and erosion. Diversity. What do you notice on native rangeland that's healthy? Is there a handful of species present or are there so many you wouldn't even want to count them? On really healthy rangeland, you'll find that, that there's 60, 100 plus species out there, right here in South Dakota, um, in, in growing areas, in regions of the country or the world where it's per perpetual growing season, we don't have those frost-free days, the species numbers could be even higher. The thing that I would point to, and none of this should be new if you've, if you've been listening to Ruth or Duane or Jason or anybody that's been involved with this organization or Soil Health or Grassland Coalition for any length of time, is that the plants we grow all fit into a category. One of these four. You could add legumes, but, but really they fall under a cool season grass or broadleaf, warm season grass or broadleaf category. And hopefully, as you're going about making cropping decisions, obviously there's economic and labor and equipment considerations that you need to make. But I hope that you're spending a fair amount of time on this because of pest and weed-related uh, concerns that would follow if your rotation is too simple. No. Natural systems don't utilize monocultures. This just continues on that point. Soil organisms and biology are very, very diverse. Therefore, what we grow on annual cropland should also be diverse. That's pretty hard when you've got one crop that you're trying to plant, care for, and harvest, and, and market. But the ways that we can really help that and achieve what's in that handful right there is, is potentially cover crop mixes, uh, potentially planting perennials. Mark touched on that just briefly. Now, if you're a farmer through and through, you don't have livestock, maybe you don't have any grassland, these types of things can be more challenging, but I hope to make the point later on in the presentation that it might be fruitful. Definitely, if we don't have all four of those crop types in your crop rotation right now, um, one of the easiest measures that you can do is, is identify a plant that you can grow that, that isn't already represented there in order to feed the diversity of, of soil biology that's present. And guess what? Anybody ever had a train wreck? Weeds, disease, something like that? Probably. Made a bad decision or didn't see something coming? That may have just simply been nature filling the gap that our crop rotation didn't. It may have been something more serious too, but, but oftentimes the simplest answer is, is the key. And it may, might simply be that we just didn't have enough diversity in our system. So the presence of living roots in the soil is incredibly important. I think Mark made that point well. I hope to build on it. I want you to just mentally note this bare naked root here. I believe that was rapeseed and these completely soil-covered roots over here, which I believe were uh, rye. 
Why? Why does a broadleaf not have any soil sticking to the roots? That wasn't manipulated, that was just straight out of a shovel and, and uh, basically shook off. Same with on the right. I think it has something to do with the presence and abundance of root exudates. The plant communicating with the surrounding soil. And we'll get into that in more detail moving forward as well. Kind of continuing on. So why are roots so important? And why are they important in restoring degraded soils? First of all, if there's a root, a living root, and it's during the growing season, we're probably performing photosynthesis. Key thing, we turn carbon dioxide into plant available carbohydrates, sugars, you name it, proteins. That energy transfers down to the roots where the roots, here's that root exudate term again, communicate with the surrounding soil environment. Bacteria, protozoa, so on and so forth. The microbiology class that I did not take in college, I really wish I would have now <laughs> because, because it's something that I'm coming to understand is that that's where the communication happens. Soil aggregation begins with grassy plants. Here's another one. Soil just completely sticking to that young rye plant and it seems to be associated with the grassy plants which in the Northern Great Plains is a really good thing because if, if soil health tells us to mimic what happens on native rangeland on our crop acres, our native rangeland sites are typically dominated to the tune of 60, even 90% grass species to 30, you know, 10 to 30% or 40% of, of broadleaves. So that really works well if our crop rotations kind of follow that model is that we can build soil pretty rapidly because we should have a, a rotation that's dominated with higher residue grassy type crops. And finally, integrating livestock. It's simply by chance, and that I haven't captured a lot of photos of sheep and goats grazing, that all four of these photos have black cattle standing on them. Uh, I have nothing against Herefords or Charlet or anything like that. It just so happens that these operations, these two operations that are represented here happen to both run black cattle. And all four of those photos represent cover crop grazing that were full season. Ruth mentioned it, so did Mark. Planting behind a small grain in our climate, a cover crop mix behind small grain in our climate is a gamble at best, right? You've got to catch that rain pretty quick, just like Mark said. So given that likelihood of failure behind a harvest, these operators, because they're diversified crop and livestock guys, went ahead and, and just took some acres out of that annual crop production and turned it into grazing land for that particular season. And neither one of them will go back because it makes them money. In the case of the two photos on the left, he does about a third of his crop acres are in full season cover every year. The one on the right, he just does it when it fits. Um, they, they have their feed and forage balance pretty nailed down. They've got enough pasture to get them through and then just use covers for a month or two about this time of year. So why livestock? If you're a straight farmer and your fields are not fenced, why would you consider the potential investment costs necessary to make that possible? Well, one, and I, as I look around this room, I see a lot more dark hair than, than gray hair. No offense to the older folks and, or more experienced folks in the room. But uh, why would you do that? Because you have the lasting, uh, the staying power to yield a return if you're, if you're young enough. Um, a, those, those infrastructure pieces are probably going to increase the value of your land. It's also going to hopefully make you a little bit less risk averse because even in the event of a crop failure if you've got a fence and water on that field you've got a way to use that if it grew even a little bit uh, without having to run wheels and a baler over it to, to make some use of it so you can read for yourselves there but but the livestock benefits really really do help because we're taking some residue that's got our macro and micronutrients tied up in it and usually takes a few seasons to degrade to become plant available. Adding a mouth 
and a rear end out there on those acres really accelerates what happens to that plant residue and making it plant available for your next cash crop. Basically reducing the need for fertility and as I understand it from a few conversations I've had recently that's probably heavy on all of your minds for the coming spring. And livestock don't take much with them. It's the, as far as zero or the export of nutrients, really all they're taking with them when they leave that, that acre is the red meat that they've grown. You know, it goes in the front and out the back. Everything is, is left right there. Uh, if you've got some trouble areas, maybe some salinity spots starting to show up in some drainages or, or things like that, uh, livestock could be a tool per maybe bale grazing on those particular acres to add some residue and get that, that water cycle kind of back in place there. That's another, way, another place where those full season cover crops could help us out because our, our length of growth, particularly if it's a diverse mix, is going to be quite a bit longer than our typical cash crop, which is probably what, 80 to 120 days on average for a growing period. Um, a full season cover crop with both cool and warm season species present should hit that. I'm just pulling this number out of the air, but 150, 160 days, we should, we should be able to more effectively use water and, and hopefully remediate some of the salinity causes there. A potential, if you, don't, if you own those livestock, definitely there's some risk in that, but a potential revenue stream, even if you don't, I think there's some real potential there and we'll get into that a little bit deeper moving forward. So what's the value of soil armor? I want to point you to this spot right here. Hopefully you can read that in the back. Uh, if not, I know there was a handful of the paper copies of this presentation that are around the room. And Ruth has a sign up. So if you would like to get mine or anyone else's presentations and you don't have one, we can make sure that gets emailed to you um, probably later this week or, or next. Just in case you can't see at the top slide here, it says uh, we, we've got under crop canopy here, a soil temperature of 87, almost 88 degrees. On the same day, under zero canopy cover, that soil temperature is at almost 108 degrees. If we transfer that right down here, and we're in a moisture starved system most years, 85% of soil moisture is lost through evaporation and transpiration. You'll see this again later, but we've all heard Dwayne Beck say, take the E out of ET. It's pretty important stuff. When soil temperatures reach that high degree, very little is available to us in the form of plant growth. They're basically just trying to survive. Stomata are open and, and they're just losing water and not much growing due to soil temperature. So if we've got that soil covered, it serves as an umbrella. And in this cold morning, if that residue is out there, it serves as a blanket. Biology is still active under there, even if it's really cold, depending on, you know, obviously it's gonna be less than if it was an 80 degree summer day, but we still have respiration of, of soil organisms happening, even in the middle of winter, uh, where we don't have these extreme Soil, ver soil temperature variations. Finally, we enhance the water cycle. We've talked about that a little bit already, but we're, we're really protecting that, that soil from evaporation. Basically, if it falls on my place, I want it to stay there. I don't want to lose it to runoff, and I don't want to lose it to evaporation, and soil armor really, really helps with that. Um, that's not to even mention the, the erosion benefits that we see just by keeping the soil covered. No disturbance. You can see two pictures here, uh, one on top of crusting, the second below of erosion. I took both of these photos in Meade County in the last couple of years. Um, what's so bad about crusting? That's a pretty thin crust. It's not one that would inhibit plant germination, but why would that be a detriment to our operation? Yep, the next time it rains, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go straight to running off once those cracks are filled. And these, this is a pretty minor crusting uh, compared to some that I've seen. 
Um, certainly going to be more prone to even wind erosion uh, as that wind starts to go. Those, those flakes, as the edges roll up, and we get a 60 mile an hour wind, it's just going to start moving all over again. Um, and the field on the bottom there, that actually had pretty decent residue cover on it, but there was a disturbance involved. It, none of that residue was really anchored other than the standing plants, um, and it wasn't enough because there was still tillage involved. And finally, mycorrhizal fungi is good. I don't care what anybody says. Fungi are good. I know there are pest species of fungi out there, and many of you probably use seed treatments. Hopefully, if you can adopt soil health to the degree that, uh, that you're more resilient, maybe you can start to back away from some of those input costs because, uh, and there are people in this room that know this far better than I do, but some of those seed treatments can also negatively impact the native fungi in our soils. Modern agriculture has done a fantastic job of simplifying things. I have a problem. Here's a product to fix it. I'll sell to you, right? Um, and we're all busy. In fact, you know, even 50 years ago, folks used to have six, eight kids and you had a labor force. And now two, three kids is kind of the average, right? Um, so our labor force is less uh, and there's a lot more products out there available to help us accomplish more with fewer people and uh, maybe even some fewer implements. So what I would say to you is as tempting as it is to just do the simple and continue to do what you're already doing because it's working. You're getting by, you're making a living, um, those things. Don't overlook the value of planning and asking yourself the hard questions of why and why not. Why can't I? Um, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there when we really put our brains to work instead of just going through our normal routine year in and year out. Many of you have maybe seen this graphic before about uh, basically what happens to soil when we introduce tillage. And I don't care at what depth that occurs. We are slicing, dicing, and making smaller aggregates to the point where uh, we, it's hard to define the difference between topsoil and subsoil depending on the depth of that tillage event. Um, it makes it more prone to erosion. It definitely makes water infiltration more difficult um, and slower. If present on any kind of a slope, the water is going to get away before you can get it into the root zone where it can really do you some good. I did have this one. I found it on the internet. I did not take the picture of the goats. But diversity is important. Um, I talked a little bit about the number of plant species you might find on rangelands, but you will find all four plant types. You might just have to be out there more than once during the growing season. Um, I would advocate for the value of cover crop mixtures, uh, particularly in a small grain dominated area like we are, because that's the spot where you can feed the soil biology that the small grains aren't communicating with through their root exudates. And your animals don't have to be black Angus cattle like I showed on the other, other slides. It could be anything. It could be goats. It could be bees. Now certainly bees aren't going to be recycling vegetative material as far as a fertility package, um, but they're going to be adding some value. Just the same because a lot of these cover crop mixes that Matt would be happy to set you up with or, or any number of other uh, agriculture service businesses um, a lot of them have flowering species in them, and for good reason, to serve the pollinators. I introduced mycorrhizal fungi just a little bit. I won't read that to you, but I'll make the case to you that if you aren't read up a little bit on what mycorrhizal fungi is and what it can do for an ag producer, um, go find it. Go type that word, even if you misspell it, Google will figure out what you're trying to get to. I actually had to check my own spelling the other day when I was putting this together. Mycorrhizal fungi, this graphic, can extend the reach of your plant roots up to 700 times or more. I don't know if anybody's really got it measured out, but it's significant. In a tilled system, we just have our plants growing in soil, almost a growing medium, 
and not a living ecosystem like we have over here on the right. So pretty significant stuff. You can't really have a functional mycorrhizal fungi network in a tilled system. We just fracture those hyphae and, and they don't come back very readily. Plant roots attract microbes to the tips where the root exudates, the carbohydrates, sugars, and proteins are emitted in return for some of the things that are beyond the reach of the plant's roots. The mycorrhizal fungi will bring it, as well as the other uh, soil biology. That results in additional growth, resulting in more carbon, basically more plant above ground. More plant, more yield. Looked at it a different way, the carbon cycle. Now, Mark kind of made me think maybe I should have been talking about nitrous oxide or something like that instead of carbon, but, but this is what I've been most familiar with here recently. And as he closed, he did suggest to us, if you work on soil health, the rest of it should fall in behind. You know, science might tell us that we need to change course a little bit in the coming decades, but for now, this is where it's at. We have to first keep our soil in place, protect it, and then try to feed that herd that is underfoot. I did a little bit of rough math, even went back to the internet to double, sh double check myself and make sure that I understood this concept, what 1% organic matter equaling 25,000 gallons of water per acre is. And... No, it's not, thank you. 25, I had to come over here to see my notes. 25,000 gallons over one acre equals an additional one inch of effective moisture for your crop to grow. How much money with, what's hard red winter wheat right now, about eight bucks? How much would one inch of water done for you in, in terms of yield? 10 bushel. 10 bushel. Another 80 bucks an acre. That'd been, that'd been pretty valuable. Now I understand that market averages, at least the last few years, have been more around four, right? Or about double what it's been historically. But even at $4, 10 bushel, I'd take another $40 in my pocket if I'm farming 1,000 acres. That looks pretty good. <laughs> so 1% organic matter, and it starts with residue, the principles of soil health. Armor the soil and don't disturb. I would point your focus to the descriptive words out here in the blue boxes because they get hard to quantify in terms of dollars. And when, when Ruth asked me for, for a title on this presentation, I said, I think I can make the case. Five principles of soil health should equal five figures of profitability. I think I can make that happen. And I, I visited with some of my colleagues and they said, be careful, Tance. <laughs> because there's so many variable factors out there and I'll, I'll throw that qualifier out right now is that I can't promise absolute results because I can't promise you it will rain. I can't guarantee that everything will work right, but when the factors align, profitability follows if we've implemented the principles of soil health. And it comes in terms of decreased compaction because with less compaction, I can infiltrate water more rapidly. And if what a lot of the climate scientists are telling us is true, and I, I don't disagree, since the ice age, the climate's been changing, right? If our, rain, if our precipitation events are getting uh, more rapid, more severe, whatever you want to call it, more water in a shorter amount of time, then we need to be able to capture that water more quickly than we have in the past, too. So if I've got my system as free of compaction as possible with improved soil biology, and soil organic matter and all of these things, I should be able to capture that water more quickly and put it in storage for my plants to use. Let's look at this example and I need to go back to the computer to read this again because I got this from a colleague down in that part of the world. So in September of 2021, 3.2 inches of rain fell in Millette County over a span of eight hours. On the right, or excuse me, on the left, you've got your typical season long, turn them out in May, go get them in October type of situation. Big pastures, probably scattered water developments, 
but you know, kind of the normal pasture situation. On the right there, you've got rotational grazing since 2006, which basically means we've decreased the duration of livestock presence on that land um, in number of days. You can see there's more plant material present there, but both sides of the fence have already been grazed in this photo. You notice that there's water visible on the soil surface on the right, not visible on the left. And this probably is a bit of an extreme example, but I wanted to put some dollars to it on, on the grassland side before we go to the crop. I'll read what Leland had shared. It's pretty easy to infiltrate at least 100,000 gallons of stored water per acre with a six inch per hour infiltration rate. And that's very doable. Six inches, I've seen as high as, as 15, 20 inches per hour um, when running two inches concurrently. Would it maintain that same rate over time? Maybe not, but I think it's pretty safe to say that we, could, we should be able to infiltrate three inches of rain on native rangeland over the span of eight hours if it's coming at that rate. So both are native rangeland. We're going to put some dollars to that. The local rural water company charges $2.50 per thousand gallons for water use down there. Using that value, if we can infiltrate 100,000 gallons of water per acre divided by 1,000 gallons, that is 100 units at $2.50 per thousand. The value of that rain was $250 per acre to the rancher on the right. The one on the left did not infiltrate 3.2 inches. He probably, he might have captured a half or one inch, but definitely valuable to both. But the same type of activity happens on cropland. Exposed soil runs off. Covered soil infiltrates. Okay, I'm going to give a nod. That's why the smiley face. Thank you, Duane, for introducing me to the concept of taking the E out of ET. Save soil moisture, fertility, fuel, and soil without tillage. The harder one to pin down is diversity. We pick that up in the long term, but it definitely reduces risk because we don't have wheat over a thousand acres. We've got wheat paired with peas. We've got other, you know, sorghum sedan, you know, break it up. Diversity over the acreage. Living roots, I think we're going to get into that a little bit more and finally incorporating livestock. So, cropland dollars by comparison. Lost soil and fertility, and really what we're looking at here is, is just the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. At minimum, the book values were telling me it was a lot more than this, but I assigned a value of $10 per acre per year because in a tilled system, we're losing soil every year. No-till systems, that's a cost, that $10 per acre per year cost. If we've adopted a soil health system, we save and effectively use moisture, just like the example that Leland had shared with me. That value has to be at least $10 per acre per year. And if 10 bushels per acre yield bump on wheat, I presume was our example, is possible even at $4 a bushel, that's $40 per acre per year if we can save even just one inch of water by adopting soil health. I'll point out my source right here. I just went online and looked at the Iowa custom rates tables. These values may or may not be accurate for this local ge geographic area. You know, but if, you're, if you own all of your own equipment, let's be sure that we're treating it as if you had hired somebody else to do it because it is depreciating, there is a cost for repairs, and obviously diesel fuel, which is, again, more expensive, just like everything else than it used to be. But $15 per acre per pass seemed reasonable on, and I did not include in here the cost of seed because I figured you're planting the same seed whether you're a tiller or no tiller, right? So I just didn't even consider that. Basically for site prep and planting, 
And then in the case of a disturbed system, uh, the erosion and fertility costs. I was not comfortable assuming a $45 to $70 per acre cost. So that's why on the previous slide I suggested 10. And that's the number that I used right here. So minimum estimated cost to plant a crop, those, and you guys know your numbers better than I do. I was just trying to walk you through the, the simple calculation to compare the two systems here. In a tilled system, we're probably looking at 40 bucks an acre on, on the low side. Is that reasonable? Those of you that know your numbers? Maybe it's too low. I hope it's too low because if that's the case, then, then the differences really make soil health shine a little bit more. Under no-till, I spoke with a local ag service business just the other day, plus the Iowa rate table. Might have been 5 to $10 per acre last year and earlier to do a burn down. This year, it's going to be 15 bucks if you're going to hire them to do it um, pre-plant. A uh, little bit more expensive on the planter, um, you know, because I think you've got probably some more moving parts in a no-till drill than, than a standard old conventional grain drill, um, and those parts are, tend to be more expensive. We should not have any costs associated with erosion, though. So we come to $33 per acre planted. So I don't know if this is realistic, but I'm making the case that it is. At least $7 per acre in your pocket because you don't have those tillage passes. Even with the more expensive chemical, it still works out. Okay, like I said, diversity is more difficult to quantify in terms of dollars because the benefits seem to be slower to, to show up and slower to um, really hit your pocketbook, but they are there. I make a few suggestions here in these lower rows as ways that you can achieve more diversity and hopefully more profitability. Not all of them will work for every situation, so I just threw some ideas out here, but um, maybe rather than just planting and going to the cash market with things, you could grow some seed for a local seed dealer as an idea. You could, if you think about your crop rotation now, the four plant types, maybe we can insert that other, that new plant type and get paid a premium for doing so. Cover crop mixtures, we'll get into the value of grazing here momentarily. Mark mentioned it and I'll make the case too, perennial plantings. A lot of our cropland is worn out, folks. It needs a break. And going into perennials, even for five to 10 years, might be a, a pretty wise thing. And if, if it stays dry, hay's gonna still be valuable. Um, I would make the case that grazing would be better for your land. Um, but as far as one year to the next, you probably make some more money off of taking some hay in the short term. Specialty crops. I guess you can grow hemp. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know anything about it, but um, other things. You know, I know folks that around Rapid City, you're close to wall drug right here if you farm nearby. A pumpkin patch might work right here, just outside of town on two acres might make you a pile of money if you're willing to put up with, with people. And a lot of us went into agriculture because we don't love people, right? But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm asking you to think outside the box is, is basically what this slide here is about. And it doesn't have to encompass your entire operation. It can be small pieces. In fact, that's the safe, safe way to try soil health out is getting into a few acres and, and making some judgments based upon what you're seeing there. That way, if you have a wreck, if it doesn't work, you didn't just lose the farm, you know? Um, you can still make your payments, hopefully, and, and try again. Identify the things that didn't work rather than just scrapping the whole idea because I think there's so many moving parts that uh, there's a learning curve and we have to reevaluate, make some changes the next year and try again. This is an important part. Nature intends for roots to be present in the soil 365 days of the year. Take a drive, mostly, you know, especially as you head towards the river breaks. Native plants occupy that ground 365 days. Cropland doesn't, but we need to raise food and fiber, right? So every place that we can add days to that, I'm not necessarily advocating that you go try plant behind wheat or oats harvest. Um, 
I'm not going to tell you not to, but it might be a risk. Full season covers with grazing uh, would be a good option. And the, the concept behind every acre counts in the eastern counties uh, is a good one. If you have yield maps um, or have just a good idea of what acres on your place are, are performing and which ones aren't, maybe those poorest acres are best suited to, to go into a conservation benefit type of thing, a filter strip, just perennial grasses. Um, you might find that your per acre yield or return, sorry, your per acre return on cropped acres improves when you start to take those, those worse acres out of production and put them into some other type of production. Okay, I got a little bit wordy when we got into the livestock principle here, but um, I think that there's, there's real value to be had here. Why not get an immediate return? If we're going to plant cover crops, there's a cost there. Um, Matt can shake his head yes or no, but we can probably get you into cover crops for 20 to 25 bucks pretty easily per acre, right, on the seed cost. Um, if there's a value that someone else is willing to pay you 30 to $45 per head per month or more, and your cost of drilling is 10 to 20 bucks, um, while that looks like a break even right here on the surface, if, if we were just to achieve $40 per head per month and got a month's worth of grazing out of it, $20 in seed and $20 for the cost of planting, we break even. But what's the lasting benefit of recycling that plant material more rapidly so that it is available for the next cash crop? I don't know. I don't, I'm not smart enough to run those calculations. But that break even looks really good in improved soil health. And Mark made the case that, you know, through his side-by-side -side comparisons, that where carbon is improving, where we have a, a, a carbon sink, we're capturing that, it's a good thing. And it returns in resilience through drought and flood. Okay, I tried to capture this. It's probably way oversimplified but hopefully this gets you thinking about your own numbers at home. And it could, it could be as simple as this, depending on how many different crops you grow. If we save $10 per acre by removing disturbance in the form of tillage, and if we earn an additional $10 per acre, we've already established that that should be $40 per acre, probably even under normal circumstances from additional water savings, now, will you get 1% additional organic matter overnight if you apply soil health principles? Probably not. Most of the science will tell you that's not the case, but you'll have a progression of improved soil organic matter, uh, presuming you have a rotation that's pretty high in carbon, mostly grassy plants with a few low residue crops scattered in here and there. But if those two things are true, and we save $7 per acre in planting by no-till, and we, even if we broke even from grazing, but let's just say $10 per acre earned, we've got $37 per acre advantage minimum, and based on $4 wheat and 10 bushels for an extra inch of water, we could turn that into $77 per acre. That seems pretty darn worth doing, especially if I farm 1,000 acres or even 500. Just start adding zeros to the back of that when things work, you know, it's got to rain. You got to get timely planted. You got to control weeds. You got to have the livestock there at the right time, the right kind of livestock, the right number of them. Um, you know, there's a lot of what ifs, right? Um, it's pretty easy to talk yourself out of this because there's an additional factor of management involved when we add the livestock. And, but I think that they're a critical point. And doing that math, it could take as little as 270 acres to achieve a minimum $10,000 return on investment for thinking about it, making some changes and moving forward. It will never look the same on two adjacent ranches, but I would encourage you as you go about your decision making on fertility, on what you're going to plant, whether or not livestock can become a part of your place or whether they stay there, um,
keep the five principles in mind. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Gabe Brown, um, Alan, shoot, Williams. thank you, Alan Williams, and uh, the other guys whose name I can't think of, but they've got the Regen Egg, I think it's called, uh, on Facebook. Uh, they've added even a sixth, princ sixth principle of soil health, and that is context. And I think they might be on to something with thinking about what works here. What am I capable of? What do I have the financial capability to do? All of those things. I think that's an important reflection of, of the reality of, of the, the financial status of ag operations today. But to not confuse the issue, if we think about these five things in our decision making and implement them, things should, can, should get better. You should last a little bit longer in the growing season when things get dry. You should infiltrate water when it downpours three inches in an hour, you know, things like that, and hold your soil in place rather than let it wash down the gully. You're not alone. My position is a new one with a focus on grazing lands in South Dakota, but that does not come at the exclusion of cropland and hayland and things like that. I'm stationed in Rapid. Kent, our soil health specialist, is in Huron. Um, you've got field offices scattered throughout the state. Just like farmers and ranchers, everybody's skill sets vary, though, and that's why we've got folks like me and Kent available on staff to, to come and consult on farm when... Uh, when you request it or when the local staff says, you know what, let's get somebody who's got a little bit more experience in this and can dedicate the time that you deserve. So that's my contact information. Again, I'll say if you didn't get the handouts but would like them, let Ruth know. She'll put your name and email address on a form. I think it's lunchtime if you don't have questions. I said those two things in backwards order. <laughs> yes. The, the biology of, of grazing cattle on cover crops. Oh, yep, here you go. Uh, the benefit of, of having cattle graze on cover crops, is, it, is there a, a greater benefit if you do it in the summer, like a season-long crop only you? Do you get more good out of manure in the summer than you do in the winter as far as the, the biology? I would make the case that yes, you probably would get more value if you're in growing season. And the reason being, uh, A, uh, volatil volatilization, right? You're not going to lose some of the nitrogen that's present in manure as, as readily as if it sits there for three months before there's a growing crop there again. Um, the other thing that really happens is, is that plants respond to grazing when done appropriately. If we take it off tabletop high like a golf course, roots shrink commensurately. That plant's just barely trying to survive. Whereas if, if we're grazing to a residual height of six, eight inches and then moving on, those cover crop, mix, especially mixtures, are gonna regrow just like your pastures do, given a little bit of rain and time. So uh, the value during the growing season could be significant. In fact, I've been kicking around the idea that there could be real value for someone who's got cropland, even in eastern South Dakota where values and rents are so much higher than out here, they also have the, the likelihood of rain during the growing season a little bit better than we do. I think that somebody could make it with livestock on cropland over there doing exactly what you're talking about, rotationally grazing annuals and, uh, and be profitable at it and improving the land while they're doing so. But the key with cover crop grazing, especially if, you, if you're an, an early or new adopter, is it's tempting to go and take it for everything it's worth and let it look like it got hayed. The, the value comes in leaving something out there to protect that soil. Um, too often, early on, when cover crops were first adopted, a lot of folks just took too much, and, and we probably lost a little ground in terms of soil health because we used too much of the forage that was out there. Need to treat it carefully just like our rangeland acres. Josh, uh, where'd that microphone go? He's coming. You briefly touched on it in that answer about haying. So this year I did a multi-species cover crop and I intended it for grazing, but I also set it up for haying, mm -hmm. knowing we are gonna be dry, or looked like we were gonna be dry. I ended up haying it for two reasons. One, I was short of hay, 
and two, I was worried about the nitrates in it and how to control that with the cattle. So it's a two-part question. How do you, if you're grazing in a dry year, how do you soften that concern of the nitrates? And then two, how is, if you hate it at a four or six inch height, what's the difference between that and leaving six to eight inches after grazing? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question, Josh. Um, and I will lean towards Chris and Ruth here just a little bit in case I, in case I get off track. Um, but first and the obvious answer is, is test. You know, what do you got there? Um, protect yourself from livestock losses. Um, but secondly, the, and you kind of answered it yourself, Josh, in that that's one of the powers of having diverse crop mixes out there, cover crop mixes, is that we don't have just German millet or just sorghum sedan out there that we know can generate a lot of nitrate issues. But we've also got the turnip or the radish, we've got the rapeseed, we've got the oats, which, you know, everything takes up these, these chemicals or these nutrients in different levels and at different times, right? In different phases of their growth period. So that helps minimize the risk. That diversity helps lower it quite some, quite a bit. Um, will that negate it? No, there's still gonna probably be some risk when we hit drought and instead of growing four feet of forage, we grow 10 inches or less. Um, to the second part of your question about, you know, if we, if we cut high and take that for hay, what's the, the difference or the negative to that versus grazing it? Uh, for one, we don't have the manure return, right? We don't, we have a net export of nutrients when we hay. And if our nutrient or nitrogen cycle uh, is going to be in balance, we can't be taking too much, right? Even just harvesting the grain off of a field is somewhere is around a third of the carbon that's generated on that field when you remove the grain. Um, that may vary across crops, but in general terms, that's, that's the way I understand it. Uh, so saliva, manure and urine, and hoof effect I would say are the, are the things that are missing when we hay instead of graze. That trampling and putting plant material in contact with the soil surface is probably understated in its value. Um, it won't catch a lot of snow if it's all completely horizontal, right? But what it does do is put it in contact with the ground so that all that soil biology, and what comes to mind of course is earthworms. Maybe we have them, maybe we don't. When it's really, really dry, they go deep if we do have them. Um, but think about an earthworm. They come to the surface at night, they get a chunk of, of plant material, and then they take it back into the ground with them and, and add that fertility in the form of their dung. The other biology basically works the same way. You know, I identify with the things that I can see but the microscopic stuff is doing that too and they're, they're not communicating necessarily but they're collaborating as a community, as an ecosystem in building fertility. So when we don't have the livestock presence, I think we miss some of that because we're not putting very much in contact with the soil surface. But more important than that, I need you to stay on, those, on that land, on that ranch. So you had to do what you had to do because that's a lot cheaper than buying hay this year, so. Um, I think we're gonna wait on any more questions until after the next speaker, because he's gonna speak after.